My name is Rosalind Porter. I'm the deputy editor of Granta Magazine. And with me today is Ken Follett, the best-selling novelist who has written a piece of memoir for us called Bad Faith about his experience of growing up in the Plymouth Brethren. Ken is going to read from his piece and there will be a short interview after. I will say no more about the piece. It's wonderful. Here it is. Thank you, Ken. I was not allowed to go to the movies as a child. There was a cinema in Cowbridge Road, Cardiff, not far from my home, and just about every boy I knew spent Saturday mornings there, watching low-budget serials about cowboys and space rockets, Robin Hood and Lassie. I feel a flash of recognition now when I read of Proust's young narrator gazing with longing at theatre posters on the Morris columns of Paris. I went instead to the public library, a hundred yards away from the cinema in the same street. I probably learned more there than my friends did at the movies, but I did not appreciate that at the time. On the contrary, I was outraged by the prohibition. We called ourselves the Fellowship, or sometimes the Church of God, but the world knew us as the Plymouth Brethren. This movement split from the Church of England in the 19th century. Such groups are as fissile as Trotskyites, and they splintered again and again. I was born into the Needed Truth Brethren, named after our magazine Needed Truth. Truth is an important word in Protestant sects. Their key text is John Bunyan's allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, one of whose heroes is Mr. Valiant for Truth. Their duty is not merely to seek the truth, but to proclaim it bravely, even, or especially, in defiance of misguided orthodoxy. Protestantism is a literal term. It was always a protest movement. My father and his brother had married two girls who were cousins, conjoining three already large families, and almost every member of the resulting clan was in the fellowship, including my four grandparents. It was forbidden to marry outside. Every sect needs jargon. We did not have churches, we had halls. Services were called meetings, the congregation was the assembly, the elders were overseers. We went to meetings three times every Sunday, and sometimes on Saturday afternoons too. The adults also went on at least one weeknight. I could bear all that, but from a young age I had trouble with the sect's strict Puritanism. In our house there was no TV, radio or gramophone. These things were worldly, an important term for us. I was often told, our citizenship is not of this world, a saying which paraphrases the letter of Paul to the Philippians, in which he says, our citizenship is in heaven. This was interpreted to mean that we should not join political parties, trade unions, the armed forces, or any kind of social club. The fellowship paid much more attention to the petty rules of Paul than to the open-hearted wisdom of Jesus. Another bad word was pleasure. We did not go to the theater, concerts, or sporting events. I recall being told that it was all right to go to the motor show to buy a gospel van, but to spend a day there just because I liked cars would be wrong, for it would be nothing but pleasure. It was an egregious sin to enter a church of another denomination, especially another branch of the brethren. I learned many years later that my father's adolescent rebellion had taken this form. At the age of 15, Dad went to a meeting of the Open Brethren. Now, the distance between their beliefs and ours was the breadth of a hair. A brother from another town could take part in our meetings only if he brought with him a letter of commendation from the overseers of his assembly. The Open Brethren, by contrast, would welcome anyone who said he belonged, without checking, hence their name. I know of no other difference, and yet my father got into serious trouble. He was seen coming out of that den of heresy, and it was reported to my grandfather. Grandad Follett, a cobbler with a little shop in Glamorgan Street, blamed too much education and announced that young Martin was leaving school the next day and would go out and get himself a job. My father, a star pupil at Canton High School, saw his white-collar future fading away. My grandmother viewed this prospect with equal dismay and pleaded for mercy successfully. My father promised never to stray again. He had been bullied into keeping the faith. When he lay dying, he told me he was having sleepless nights, worrying about what the future holds. 
This shocked me. He knew he had terminal cancer and I had assumed he felt confident about what would happen to him after death. Is that not the great consolation of religious belief? It seemed he was not as convinced as he had always pretended to be. I did not take him up on this, feeling it would be unkind, but reflecting on it, as I have done often since he died, I wonder if perhaps he wanted me to challenge him. Why else would he have said it? Did he feel the need to confess doubts he'd never previously acknowledged? If so, I was too slow-witted to see it. When we mourn, the lost opportunity to say important things is a large part of our sadness. In my father's adolescence, there was another crisis, according to family legend, when a music teacher told Grandad Follett that Martin had the potential to be a concert pianist. From that day, my father never had another lesson for fear that he would have been tempted to go on the stage. That would have been worldly. For the first 10 years of my life, I lived in Leckwith Avenue, a cul-de-sac of tiny row houses tucked into the fork of a railway line. The main track to Swansea was at the bottom of our garden, and on the other side of the narrow street was a branch line to Ninian Park, the home of Cardiff City Football Club, to which I was not allowed to go. The embankments, front and back, formed our playground, and we thought nothing of venturing onto the tracks. It seems a miracle now that there was never an accident. At the closed end of the street was a scout hall. I was the only boy in the street who was not a cub. At the other end was an open brethren hall. I peeped in once. It was a plain room with chairs around a central table. On the walls were framed texts, but no pictures, and certainly no idolatrous statues. It looked exactly the same as our hall, but my parents never thought of entering the place. Every Sunday, in our best clothes, carrying our Bibles, we went past the door three times and walked another half mile to our own hall in King's Road. This kind of thing is not uncommon in Wales. There is a joke about a Welshman shipwrecked on a desert island who built two chapels. When he was rescued, they asked him what the second chapel was for, and he said, that's the one I don't go to. My Uncle Ken left our sect and joined the Navy. After this rebellion, he repented and entered yet another splinter group called the Exclusive Brethren. He started wearing a hat because the Bible, Paul again, says that men should take off their hats in church, and how can you take off your hat if you're not wearing one? That was just silly, but it was hurtful when he would not sit down at the table with his mother. I recall a fish and chip supper at Nan Evans's home in Aberdare when Uncle Ken took his food into an empty room because to eat with people outside the exclusive brethren, even his own family, would have violated the rules. When my mother died many years later, Uncle Ken was not allowed to attend the funeral, even though she was his sister, because it was the service of a rival sect. However, several people reported seeing him in the village that morning. He had driven 70 miles just to stand in the street and watch the hearse go by. Everything we did had to be bent towards the kingdom of heaven, our true home. There was a problem with music, though. Strictly speaking, we should have had nothing but hymns. But we're Welsh, and even the most devout among us found it hard to live on a restricted musical diet. There was always a piano in the house, and both my parents played classical pieces as well as sacred music. Eventually, they weakened enough to buy a radiogram. However, rock and roll was banned. It did not take us kids long to sniff out the hypocrisy in that. American fundamentalists were equally fanatical but smarter, and they produced records that sounded like pop music but had religious lyrics. I recall a swinging number that went something like this. This world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? I caused a crisis by buying an album of this kind of stuff called Canaan's Land. The grown-ups hated it, but had trouble defending their position. My formidable Uncle Eddie said it was jungle music. In response to that, I said, Uncle Eddie should not criticize other people's forms of worship. This piece of precocious impudence was repeated all around the family, causing shock, but some laughter as well. I did not have the guts to say it directly to Uncle Eddie, 
but he soon heard of it, and I expected to be carpeted. To his credit, he didn't reprimand me, but just looked thoughtful. I do not have the soul of a Puritan, and I began to disobey as soon as I was old enough to get away with it. I loved movies and dancing on Saturday night and smoking cigarettes. Tobacco was prohibited as a lust of the flesh. I bought a guitar and did not use it to play hymns. The doctrine was harder to throw off. In my early teens, I still believed in the literal truth of the Bible. Everyone in our family read the Bible every day. I followed a course of home study that required me to read all 66 books without skipping anything. I had to answer questions on each book before going on to the next. This did me no harm. Much of the King James translation is by William Tyndale, one of the greatest ever writers of English prose. I should have read it twice. My parents also read the Times and Reader's Digest, and my father made the crucial mistake of ordering by mail the Reader's Digest Great World Atlas. I read everything printed that came into the house, I think all writers do this when young, and when I sat down to read the introduction to the Atlas, I learned about continental drift, the theory that the continents are parts of a jigsaw that are slowly moving apart over millions of years, and so I began to doubt the Bible, thanks to the Reader's Digest. I felt tremendous guilt about these doubts. I was going against my parents' most profound convictions. The open arguments were all with my father, but the moral pressure came from my mother, who in later life used to warn my Catholic Filipina housekeeper that she was going to hell. I was much helped by Edmund Gosse's autobiographical book, Father and Son, the story of a young man who rejects the Plymouth Brethren. It was a great comfort to me as an adolescent to realise that I was not the first boy to suffer these agonies of conscience. My crisis came over the doctrine that our citizenship was not of this world. Another version of this edict came from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, be not unequally yoked with unbelievers. A yoke is a wooden frame placed on the necks of a pair of draught animals so that they can pull the plough together. And Paul's instruction refers back to the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, thou shalt not plough with an ox and ass together. The brethren, were too special to sh the brethren were too special to share a task with the rest of the unenlightened world. A group of adolescents from our assembly, led by one of the overseers, started to visit an old folks home once a week for an hour on Wednesday evenings. We played board games with the residents and listened to them talk about the old days. They broadened our minds and perhaps we brightened their lives a little. Incredibly, this activity was judged by the other overseers to be an unequal yoke and forbidden. By now I was 16 and able to recognise arrant nonsense when I saw it and I left the fellowship never to return. I was still a Christian, though a troubled one. About this time I had to decide what to study at university, and I chose philosophy in the hope that it would help me resolve my doubts about the existence of God. It certainly did. At University College London, the merciless light of linguistic philosophy was shone on the ideas of Plato, Descartes, Marx and Wittgenstein. We did not discuss religion much, but privately I applied the tests of evidence and logic to religious ideas. None of them passed. By the time I graduated, I was an atheist. And an angry one. I felt I'd been duped. I resented the hours I'd wasted at meetings, the childhood without movies or television, the prohibition on joining the Boy Scouts. Most of all, I was angry that I'd believed the rubbish that I'd been fed. Nothing's more infuriating than the revelation that one has been stupid. I also believed they had tried to steal something from me. Making moral decisions is an essential part of what it is to be human. Most people would agree with that, but it carries an implication noted by the existentialists. If you hand moral responsibility to another authority, the Bible or a priest or the Pope, you may simplify your life, but you lose part of your humanity. This is what Sartre calls mauvaise foi, translated as bad faith or self-deception. Philosophy turned out to be the beginning, not the end, of my journey. 
I'm reminded of Picasso's famous remark, it took me four years to paint like Raphael, but a lifetime to paint like a child. I took three years to become an atheist, and I've spent the rest of my life finding my way back by an implausibly roundabout route to a kind of spirituality. It happened like this. When I started to try to write novels, I found I had no vocabulary for describing buildings. To remedy this defect, I read A Concise History of Western Architecture by Robert Furno Jordan. It was the beginning of a lifelong enthusiasm, and more than that. The most fascinating of all buildings for me were the great European cathedrals of the Middle Ages. I began to visit cathedrals and read about them, and I was soon struck by the questions that occur to most people when looking at such a building. Why is this here? Why did the people of the Middle Ages want one of these? And they wanted them badly. A cathedral cost a fortune. A moonshot is a comparable modern project. Yet the men and women who put it up lived in wooden houses without chimneys and slept on the floor. Construction was extraordinarily difficult with hammer and chisel and an iron measuring rod. Just look at the complex three-dimensional curves of a vaulted ceiling. Then remember, that the master mason had no knowledge of the cubic equations that describe such shapes. And building took decades, often employing multiple generations of masons and carpenters. What drove these people? I soon began to think that this question might power a long, popular novel. There was only one novel, as far as I could see, about cathedral building, The Spire by William Golding, which focuses on a monk's spiritual relation to the tower he's putting up. You'd be hard put to find two novelists as different as Golding and me, and I felt confident that what I wrote would be nothing like his book. The Pillars of the Earth is the story of the building of a fictional medieval cathedral and of the way the construction project changes the lives of everyone in the neighbourhood. Right at the start I saw that the story would have to feature at least one admirable character who's a sincere Christian, if only for realism. I gritted my teeth and created Prior Philip, a very practical monk who cares for the spiritual and material welfare of his people here on earth and never tells them to suffer patiently because they will be happy in heaven. He's probably the best character I've ever written. It's a long book, 375,000 words, and it took me three years and three months to write. I found it extraordinarily difficult, and when it was finished, I experienced imagination fatigue for the first time, but the result was on a level different from anything I'd written previously, and it found a huge audience. And of course I saw the irony of an atheist writing a much-loved novel about a church. When I met Barbara, my second wife, I became actively involved in the Labour Party, and I was surprised to find that some of our allies were devout Christians. It turns out that there are many prior Phillips in the real world anguished by the material and spiritual poverty of some of their neighbours, just as Labour Party activists are. I began to feel embarrassed by my contemptuous, youthful dismissal of believers. My discomfort was eased when the Catholic press attacked Barbara and me for being pro-choice. We were used to unfair reporting from the Conservative papers, of course. In fact, when we were pilloried on the front page of the Mail on Sunday, we took it as a sure sign that we were doing something right. But somehow, I expected Christian journalists to be more honest. Silly me. I continued to visit cathedrals long after Pillars was finished, and eventually I had to admit that something else was drawing me to these places. Then Barbara became the Member of Parliament for Stevenage. Going to church services is one of the duties of an MP's spouse, but I found myself enjoying them and began to go even when I didn't have to. I now describe myself as a lapsed atheist. I still don't believe in God and I never take communion, but I like going to church. My favourite service is choral evensong. So today, half a century after I escaped from the fellowship, I'm a churchgoer again. Not regular, but not infrequent either. Our 30th wedding anniversary happened to fall on Remembrance Sunday last year, and Barbara and I celebrated by going to the service at St Albans Cathedral. Why do I go? The architecture, the music, the words of the King James Bible, and the sense of sharing something with my neighbours all work together. What they create, for me, is a feeling of spiritual peace. 
going to church soothes my soul. And I have at last figured out that is exactly what it's supposed to do. What a long time it takes us so often to understand the simplest truths. Thank you, Ken. That was wonderful to hear. It's amazing to hear you actually reading this piece and your words. And it's also extraordinary to think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was the Reader's Digest that was the sort of main catalyst for you being able to break free of the Plymouth Brethren? It is kind of surprising, <laughs> isn't it? Um, but there it was, this very straightforward statement of the fact mm. that the continents were drifting apart, mm. which clearly completely contradicted the Bible story. And um, at that point, it seemed to me that the Reader's Digest was right. Mm. And I suppose if, if I hadn't read that, I might have read something else. Sure. Or there might have been a teacher at school who said something about biology that simply contradicted the Bible. So I guess it was going to happen sooner or later. But it, was, isn't, it is, you're right, it's kind of amusing that it should be that frightfully conservative organisation, the Reader's Digest, who did it for me. And which possibly made you the novelist that you are today. I mean, the other, <laughs> the other question that I have, which I thought of a lot the first time I read this piece, was could you have been, could you be the novelist that you are today without the Plymouth Brethren? I mean, you talk about the influence of the prose of the Bible. Um, and you touch a little bit on the discipline of having to kind of read this stuff over and over and over again. And of course, writing novels and writing as many novels as you have written takes this extraordinary amount of discipline. Because um, people always say to me, you're terrifically disciplined, and I don't feel that at all. Mm. It, it comes naturally to me to, um, to study, to do research for my books, and then to work all day at writing, and then to revise. And I'm never bored, and I, I'm never impatient to do something else. Um, it's, it's, not, it's easy for me. I, mm. I kind of don't really feel, I don't feel that I'm a disciplined person because I don't have to force myself. But yes, you're probably right. Mm. That probably comes from that rather strict upbringing. Mm. And when you read this Reader's Digest Atlas, you were about 16. Yes, but a and, bit less than that, yeah. And you say in the piece that that was when you sort of left the Brethren. But what does that mean? I mean, you're 16 years old. Presumably, you still lived at home with your parents. And presumably, you were still financially and emotionally dependent on them for lots of things. Yes. How did they take it? How did they take this decision? And, and what did it actually look like? How did your life change? Well, I stopped going to those meetings. Mm. Um, and they were very upset about it. In fact, they told me more than once that they believed I was going to go to hell. Um, if they really believed that, I mean, if I thought my children were going to hell, I think I'd put my head in a gas oven. Mm. So I can't quite get my mind around what they really thought in their deepest hearts. But they were very troubled um, mm. by my loss of faith mm. in all this stuff. Um, as time went by, theirs weakened a bit although not very much, particularly not my mother's. Um, and uh, one of the things that happened in the course of this conflict was that my father stopped giving me any money. Mm. Now, of course, I didn't need much, but I did have to get the bus to go to school. Mm. Uh, and so I got a job um, washing up in a hotel on Sundays. They hated the fact that I was working on Sunday. Sure. Um, but on the other hand, they weren't giving me any money. So I needed a job to get to school. Mm. And uh, so uh, we continued. I mean, the conflict continued. And what about your friends and your peers? I mean, presumably your social life completely changed as well. Uh, yes, that's true. But, but the, the group in the church that I socialised with, with was the group that went to that old folks home together mm. and we all left together oh, I see. because we okay. all saw, saw that this was nonsense yeah. and uh, in fact one of the girls in that group um, was the girl I married, it was my first wife Mary. <laughs> so um, my social life didn't suffer very much. Good, <laughs> glad to hear it. <laughs> um, I think this is the first time you've written about this experience of having grown up 
in the Plymouth Brethren yes. and becoming an atheist yeah. and then becoming, as you say, a lapsed atheist. Yes, I've never written about this before and I've, I sort of forgot about it for a long time. Mm. Um, but I'm writing a novel now, which I've almost finished, about the 16th century and about the wars of religion. And that brought back to me all this stuff about Protestantism and Catholicism. And did it bring back the feelings as well? I mean, you talk in the piece about being so angry about being fed something that's so yes. stupid. And the sort of, there's a slight sort of anger, anger there. Yes, there is, there is. And of course, um, the 16th century people who argued about religion were very angry with one another. In fact, they killed one another, mm. burned one another to death in the 16th century over these theological issues. I actually, writing about this for a 21st century readership, I had to, I had to try to step back a little from that because nobody in the 20th, 21st century is really going to empathize with people who really believe it's right to burn someone to death because they don't believe uh, you know in the doctrine of transubstantiation mm. so in fact I, I sort of had to be careful not to enter too enthusiastically into the arguments of my childhood <laughs> uh, for fear of alienating the readers. But yes, yeah, so all, of, all of those feelings came back, yes, mm. thinking about uh, religion and the Bible and uh, the, the things people said and the, the stupid arguments that people used, really. My dad was, was a sincere man, but he would, occasionally, he would occasionally come up with really specious arguments. Mm. You know, and um, looking back, I thought, I think some of the things he said to me weren't really worthy of his intelligence. Mm. Do you think he knew that? Do you think he was parroting something or, and possibly the stupidity of the arguments had to do something with his disbelief? It's very possible. It's you very don't. possible that he was, now, I can see now being a parent and grandparent myself, it's very possible that he was unnerved. Mm by what I was saying, mm. and that he had to work very hard not to show that, not to show that, that my doubts actually found an echo in his own heart. And um, I think all parents know the feeling of saying something to your child that you know is not the whole truth, but you feel your child is just not old enough sure. for, the, for the subtleties and contradictions of the truth. Yes. And uh, yeah, I bet you're right. I bet that's what was really happening. Hmm. Well, thank you so much for reading the piece and having a slightly candid conversation with me about your feelings about um, the Plymouth Brethren and religion more generally. Um, it's been a huge pleasure to have you and uh, we look forward to having you in Granta again. Thank you, Ken. Thank you.